The following show is a Pod Avenue production. Welcome to your weekly trip down memory lane. Booking Booking Memphis. Memphis. Reliving the biggest moments in the history of wrestling's greatest territory. Me, Memphis style. You're from Memphis, Tennessee. Is that how you talk to Memphis? They'll sleep this long. They want to see the king. You think anybody would pay to come down and see a sawed off runt? Bug eyed Bill Dundee? No. They come to see me, baby. I feel good. I feel like doing it, daddy. I feel like doing it, your best, baby. When I get a chance, and I don't care where it is, Lola, believe me, I am going to take you out. You want to be nuts? Well, I can be a little nuts too, Daddy. So it ain't playing no wrestling games, Jack. You're not throwing nothing in my face, and you ain't sneaking up behind and doing nothing to the superstar. And now, here are your hosts, the legendary Jerry Jerry. Hundreds of wrestlers a month wanted to come to Memphis. People that had never been in the ring to people that had headlined one of the other territories. And Sean Reedy. And welcome back, everybody, to another week of Booking Memphis Wrestling, where we celebrate the greatest wrestling promotion of all time. I am your co-host, Sean Reedy. You can follow me on Twitter at SeanReedy16. And I am joined by the man who wrote the most entertaining TV show in the history of American TV, in my opinion, and that is my truthful opinion, Mr. Jerry Jarrett. Uh, How are you today, sir? Great, Sean, and I hope life is good for you. Oh, it's always great when I get to talk to you, especially about some uh, fascinating historical stuff and get some first-person perspective from you who were there through some uh, crazy things. So what we're talking about today, long before the Monday Night Wars, before there was a Vince McMahon war on the territories, there was a famous wrestling war in the 70s in the Atlanta Territory. Uh, resulting from a death of a promoter and his wife taking over and there being a bit of a dispute. And uh, this was something that was a big deal. The whole NWA got involved, and our co-host was an integral part of how it turned out. Yes. Um, Buddy Fuller had swapped his ownership with Lester Welch, and Buddy was in Florida, And Lester was left with the war because Ann Gunkel chose to start her own wrestling promotion and break off. Um, The original story is that uh, Ray Gunkel owned it with uh, Lester Welch, and then he passed away, and she became involved, and she could not get along. Or I'm sorry, she was with Buddy Fuller originally. And they could not get along, and then Buddy sold it to Lester, and they could not get along either. And this led to her splitting off and there being an actual promotional war in Atlanta. Right. After after Ray Gunkel died, what what happened is that Lester um, really got stuck with Ann and, and her wanting to have her own thing. And that's okay, except that the honorable thing to have done would have been to go to Lester Welch and said, pick a number and I will either buy you out or you can buy me out for that number. And that kind of holds the parties to the same standard. If you're willing to buy or sell at a given price, that pretty much establishes your view of the value of the territory. And, but that didn't happen. Anne decided to go on her own and not pay Lester and not pay Paul Jones and just kind of put them out of business. And you said she, in your book that things were so bad that uh, Lester's son actually changed the locks on the office and locked her out while they were still partners? Well, first she locked him out. Oh, okay. And then uh, Roy Lee called me and said, what in the world do I do? What do you recommend? Daddy's so mad, I'm afraid he's going to 
do something crazy. And I said, just call a locksmith and put new locks on the door and play the same childish game. And, and Roy Lee did that. So this was an ugly situation. Yes, it was untenable. So, Anne was a very attractive lady. And she charmed uh, Ted Turner. And there's all kind of speculation. I don't know if they had a romantic relationship or or if he just felt sorry for the widow. I don't know. But anyway, he gave her a, a television show that followed our TV show. There was only one incident when we were both running, and I was there, uh, that her wrestlers were getting there when we were all leaving. And it didn't amount to anything other than some name-calling and some jawing. Uh, I think Tony Atlas was involved. So you, but, were, uh, you were actually taping at the same studio, like back-to-back? -back? Oh, yeah, okay. same same, every, same everything. So, let me back up because that was after I was there. When the war first started, Buddy Fuller uh, felt really bad about selling Lester or swapping interests with Lester and Buddy taking... Lester's percentage in Florida and where it was beautiful and nice weather in Florida and, and great partners. And Lester ended up in a wrestling war with a partner that was totally unreasonable. So one night or one day I got a call and it was Buddy, and he said, I'm down here with Eddie, and we would like to come pick you up and us go to Atlanta and plan some strategy. And so he did. And we flew back to Atlanta in Eddie Graham's plane and went to a hotel, and while we were in Atlanta to have a conversation I don't really remember, but I think some of the principals uh, were involved. I know Lester was, so that was reason enough. But at any rate, we had a we had a meeting, and my input was simply uh, when I had my war with Nick and Roy, I just put on better matches. So. With the backing of the NWA, I don't see why you just can't out-promote her. But at any rate, that meeting took place, and then the next thing I know, uh, Buddy calls me and says, Lester is selling his interest to Jim Barnett. And Jim is coming back to the States from Australia. And he would like to talk to you about being the booker. And, of course, I told Buddy, I said, you know, I'm pretty entrenched here. Um, and he said, I think you can oversee Tennessee long enough to um, help Barnett get started. And I said, okay, tell him to um, come to Hendersonville and we'll talk. And I told Buddy then, I said, tell Jim that I'm very, very expensive. <laughs> and uh, Buddy laughed and said, oh, Jim's got plenty of money. I don't think money's a problem. And you could say this because the Memphis territory that you had been booking for about five or six years at this point was doing tremendous business, right? Yes, yes, very good. And so at any rate, Jim flies um, 
to Nashville. Uh, I, for some reason, I think I picked Jim up at the airport. Um, I, you know, I could be wrong on that. Buddy could have picked him up. But I do know that we met at my house in Hendersonville, and it was Buddy Fuller, myself, Jim Barnett, and my wife, Deborah. Uh, one thing that was amusing is after we greeted each other, Jim spent the better part of the next hour and a half in the kitchen talking to my wife, Deborah, about who knows what, all <laughs> kind of cooking and designer clothes and Lalique and Steuben glass and all those kind of things. Buddy and I sat in my living room and kind of looked stupid at each other. <laughs> and Buddy said, Jim's a little different. You don't know him, but uh, he'll come in when he gets ready to. And I said, well, okay. So uh, anyway, Jim finally walked in, and he was, you know, he was very flamboyant person and he said uh, are you willing to come to Atlanta I said are you willing to pay me through the nose and he said yes uh, will you come and I said yes he said okay what is pay me through the nose I said 500 a day if I stay there seven days that's 3500 if I stay there two days that's a thousand and it's not negotiable, Jim. I'm making a lot of money where I am. And, uh, and he said, well, will you guarantee me a sellout? And, uh, after four weeks and I said, of course, I'm the greatest booker in the wrestling business today. According to your book, Mr. Barnett had uh, my phrase, that you were his genius booker. Oh, he, t he adopted that phrase. Now, I'm thinking that Jim's ribbing me, and I'm turning around and ribbing him back. But Jim took it very serious. And he said, when he left, he said, uh, when can you go down? I said, when do you want me there? He said, I'd like for you to go a couple of weeks before I get back, before you take over and get acclimated to the talent and the territory. And I said, okay. So I made plans to be there Friday week from when he left. And when I got there, I realized, uh, in my opinion, that it would not be very hard to get the territory to drawing money. I went to the city auditorium, and the matches were horrible, just very lethargic, uh, very slow. There was nobody that seemed to have any heart uh, or passion. And in your and, book, you said the writing was less intriguing and less attention was given to the storylines. Yes, it, it absolutely was. And so I went to Buddy and I said, uh, uh, Buddy, this is going to be pretty easy. Uh, I, I said, I don't think I can use uh, the talent that's here, maybe Bob Armstrong and Robert. But that's about it. And he said, do whatever you want to do. And so I went back home and I called Bill Watts and I said, Bill, I would like to put the title. I, uh, my first night there, I would like to book you against Ron Fuller and I'd like to put the title on you on him and he said no I said well who will you put the title on I said he said well I my plan was to keep it too close to Tulsa right 
Well, I don't. I mean, I don't know what he said, but my plan was to keep it, and I'll come in from time to time and defend it. And I said, Bill, for whatever reason, Jim Barnett, the owner, has decided that he wants me to book it, and I don't see that. You fit in to the talent that I'm going to bring in. So that first conversation did not end well. And then he called me back and and finally agreed that he would put the title on Ron and did. And um you know that's that then we started and right away I brought Uh, I called Tim Woods because Tim was a real superstar there and wasn't wrestling there. And Tim said, Jerry, I appreciate the offer, but I am, I'm retired and I don't want to come back. Mr. Wrestling. Mr. Wrestling. It's Tim Woods. So I, you know, I said, well, okay. Uh, uh, my plan is that's a stumbling block, so I'll just try to capture the aura of Mr. Wrestling, and I'll bring Johnny Walker and call him Mr. Wrestling 2. And I did that, and, well, I called Johnny, and I said, uh, uh, if you'll go get a white mask and a white outfit, do you know... Tim Woods, Mr. Wrestling? He said, yes. I said, well, this is my plan. He said, I'm your man. And uh, Johnny was not only a good worker, he was a good wrestler and, uh, and was my friend. So he came in. Uh, I brought Terry Garvin and Jim Garvin and Ronnie Garvin. Uh you know, as the Garvins, uh, I call my friend Luthez, and uh, then I had Fargo and Tojo. I couldn't bring them in, but and Lawler, but I had, you know, I incorporated them in, and suddenly the city auditorium went from drawing 2,000 people to the night Jim was there, the people were lined up around the building three deep when they closed the box office and said nobody else could get in. It was, Jim had his sellout the first night back, and that's when he dubbed me his genius booker (laughs) and, uh, went around the country telling everybody. Uh, it's the damnedest thing I ever saw. He told me he would have a sellout when I got back, and he did. Well, I was really joking with him, but fate smiled on me, and that's what we had. So I, so, I feel like I've asked you a few times on the show why so many people liked you so much. The fact that this big power broker in the NWA was going around the country calling you a genius was probably a great thing for you and your reputation, right? Well, yes. I mean, you know, it couldn't have been better because Atlanta was thought of as kind of a, a premier wrestling city, uh, much, much more than Memphis at the time in Memphis. We were kind of a deep, dark secret and, and our talent that was there wanted to keep it that way Hmm. because they didn't want, new talent coming in, taking their place. Hmm. So there was not a lot of bragging about how much we were drawing. The The only exposure was if uh, one of the wrestling after wrote in the wrestling magazine, and I asked Bill, I said, cover us, Bill, all you want to, and I'll cooperate. But, you know, I really don't want you to tout how much money we're drawing. And I did that 
mostly for Fargo and Tojo and and my talent. But at any rate, back to Atlanta. Um, we started drawing packed houses week in and week out. And Anne, and of course, let me stop here and give credit where credit's due. I could pick up the phone and call Eddie Graham and tell him I'd like to have so-and-so. And if he didn't get them for me the week I asked, they would be available the next week or the week after that. So I really could cherry pick talent as I needed them. But as anybody that's followed Memphis knows, when I brought in outside talent, I brought them in as a special attraction and did not incorporate them into the the storylines and the programs. Uh, the, the program that kicked Atlanta off was a very simple storyline based on respect. I had this tremendous respect for Luthez from the time I first met him at the Hippodrome in Nashville when I was a 12 or 13-year-old kid taking tickets up on the front door. And so I thought the biggest disrespect that I can imagine would be a flamboyant sissy to slap Luthez in the face. And that happened, and and Lou didn't get to take revenge because the finish I set up was that Terry faked a heart attack <laughs> right when Lou came after him. So, uh, and, you know, we, we milked. I mean, we set up the cards so that uh, the people didn't mind a short match because there was a, you know, a lot of other hot matches on the card. And I, I didn't, I deliberately didn't put it on last, as I recall. Um, but at any rate, the return um and the return after that, we drew money for a long time with that program. Um, Bob Armstrong was a big card and really helped us. So, at that point, Barnett came to me one day and said, uh, I got a call from a confidant of Ann and they are inquiring if I would be willing to buy Ann's interest. And so my question was, how much? And it was really a modest price. So I suggest, I su Jim was asking for my opinion. So I suggested that, uh, that he pay her rather than us continue with, even though we were winning the war big time, I suggested that, uh, he do, he did pay her and we went, his attorney at the time was a man named Tench Cox and he was a very prominent Atlanta attorney. I don't know if Mr. Cox is still alive or not, but Jim asked me to go with him and we went to the meeting and Jim put the, all the conditions, you know, not to compete within a hundred miles of Atlanta and all that stuff. So he, um, that contract is what really ended the war technically. The reality was the the Garvin Thez program ended the war because Anne realized right then and there that uh, she couldn't compete. 
That is the story that happened. That is the true history. Um, Ron Fuller's account is that Bill Watts was there when the war ended, and that's just not true. Sean, that's my narrative of the actual accounts. Uh, If anybody's interested, the two people besides me that were actually there that I know are alive is Roy Lee Welch and Robert Fuller. Watts was not there, so his account is not any better than Ron Fuller's account. Um, But anyway, if you have any questions uh, about the details or anything else, Sean, please ask me. Yeah, I mean, there's so many fascinating figures involved with this story, historical people. So I just have questions from uh, reading Chapter 9 of your book, The Best of Times, that can be found at Amazon.com. Um, you mentioned that before this, Jim Crockett had actually, Jim Crockett Sr., had offered you an opportunity to book the Carolinas, which is interesting because of what happened later with them expanding so much. Do you remember those talks and why that didn't go through? Oh yeah, yeah. Jim Jim called me and and asked if I would come over and meet with him. Uh, I told him, Jim, I really am a homeboy, and and I love Memphis, and I'm making more money than I ever dreamed I would make. And he said, Well, will you just come over and visit with me and I respected Mr. Crockett because he was one of the most successful of the old territory promoters that there ever was. And he was a big man, and he sat in a folding chair at the back of the arena. And when I came to visit, I sat there with him, and he had some you know, he had some exciting matches and, and he, a well run territory. I just think that he felt like that his bookers were getting a little stale, which happens. Uh, I got stale and Lawler would come in and rest me and then Lawler would get stale and I would rest him and I never could really figure out why more territories didn't rotate bookers without losing them. Uh, Dusty Rhodes was a good booker, but he just stayed in Florida and stayed and stayed and wore out his welcome. Uh, Maybe it's because uh, of an ego problem with bookers. They don't want to take a second seat. Uh, I never had any trouble with that, and Lawler never had any trouble with that. Um, you know, we like to be profitable. I mean, but I'm- at any rate, I, I thank Jim and went on my way. Frank Tunney in Canada did the same thing. And because I respected these people, I would go see them. But, you know, I told them all, um, that, you know, Memphis was my home. Nashville was my home. Louisville was my home. Uh, Tupelo, Mississippi, and Jonesboro, Arkansas, and Lexington, Kentucky. These were towns that were in my backyard. And so the reason for the me accepting the Atlanta job was several reasons. One was Eddie Graham. You know, I loved Eddie. He was res- in great part responsible for me being in the business. Uh, I love Buddy. He and I were partners. Um, all of these people said, if we don't stick together for this fight, 
then none of us are safe. Somebody can can come in and uh, take our business. So I went. Yeah, but this was viewed as a major threat to the NWA system of territories. That's right. That's right. It uh, sure was. Let me ask you about Jim Barnett because he's such a another mythical figure in wrestling history, and everybody does their their Jim Barnett impression of saying "my boy" and everything. But you call him one of the most intelligent people you've ever met in wrestling. Um, what made him so smart and uh, significant in the industry for so long? I think if I had to capsule it, Jim knew what he didn't know. And very few in the wrestling business you could say that about. Jim knew that he wasn't a finished man. Jim knew that he he couldn't write stories and, and, and project them on television. So by knowing what he couldn't do, he hired people that were good at it. And he did it in Australia and he did it in Atlanta. And it was really sad because he normally was a great judge of people. And it was really sad that he picked some partners that double crossed him and, and sold the territory out from under him. So what would you say, you know, uh, were his major strengths that he brought to the table? Was it his, his ability to have relationships with powerful people and, and, and make deals? Oh, absolutely. He was highly thought of in the uh, state politics of Georgia, in the city politics uh, of Atlanta. Um, Jim contributed heavily. Uh, there is a famous picture of Mr. Wrestling 2, Johnny Walker, with President Jimmy Carter's mother. She was a huge wrestling fan. But nobody stops and asks, well, how did they get together? Well, they got together because of Jim Barnett Hmm. and his relationship with the President of the United States. And uh, you know, Ten- Tench Cox was one of the most prominent attorneys in Atlanta. So Barnett comes from Atlanta, and he didn't ask how much, uh, what's your retainer, Mr. Cox. He just said, I want you to be my attorney, and I'll pay you your retainer. He didn't. As I mean, he didn't say, how much will you charge me when he came to my house? He said, will you be my booker? And I said, I'm very expensive. He said, and he fluffed his hand, you know, in a, <laughs> in a way that kind of was, that's a silly question, my boy. And he just said, uh, I said, well, I want 500 a day. And, and you got to remember what 500 a day was in 1973 or four. Oh, sure. And uh, he just said, uh, you're my booker. And Jim always understood that if you are have the very best, don't look for a Walmart discount. And and he he knew business, basic business, and he was great at it. And and then you know Jim could be so charming. Uh, my wife and her girlfriend went to Atlanta uh, at Jim's request because, you know, he had met her at my house. And so he goes in to one of the real 
hoity-toity restaurants down there and introduces Deborah to the maitre d as you know some New York socialite <laughs> and Deborah said it embarrassed me until I realized all these people believed him <laughs> and and you know uh, at Neiman Marcus in Atlanta when you used to walk in that in the door the the La Ligue and the Steuben and all the glass was over on the right as you walked in and Deborah went with him one time and and the lady that ran that department came out and said oh Mr. Barnett I haven't seen you in a month it's so good to see you well that blew Deborah away that you know here they know him. Well, you know, I told Deborah, I said, if you bought $10,000 worth of glass from them, they'd know you too. <laughs> but but that was just Barnett. He was very, very uh, flamboyant. Do you know, is it true to your knowledge that Vince kept him on as a consultant, like even into the 2000s, like towards the end of his life? I don't know about that i know jim worked for him i know that jim had a wwe had a show in the carolinas and and jim had a very innocent dinner with with i think jim crockett and uh and vince fired barnett oh and I don't know this for a fact. I never brought it up to Jim. Every time I'd go to to Atlanta or through Atlanta, Jim and I would have lunch because I really liked him. And uh, I never brought it up. But the rumor is that he, when when Vince fired him, he committed suicide or tried to commit suicide and failed. Ah. Uh, I don't know if he if he went back or not. The last time I saw Jim um, was in Atlanta, and we had lunch uh, not far. And uh, um, who went with us? Um, anyway. Uh, we had lunch, and I brought him a very expensive bottle of wine, and Jim's eyesight was bad, and I tried to get him to let me drive him to his apartment. He said, no, I need to walk, and his eyesight was bad, and he stepped off the curb and broke the bottle of Pouli Fousse wine and cut his wrist. Um and and then shortly after that, somebody called and said uh, Jim passed away. Wow. How about this one? I tracked down a post that you made on the Internet in 2005 where you say that Buddy Fuller suggested at one point that Jim sell you his Australia territory. And you say the Fuller suggestion is another story of intrigue, but that's for another time. Uh is now a good time? Is there a good story there? Well, yes, yes. Uh, before the Atlanta deal came up, Buddy came to my farm and said, uh, you know, you like horses as much as I do, and uh, and I have been thinking about taking Jim up on it myself, but Flossie, that was... Uh, but his wife said, Flossie will have no part of it. Uh, but Jim asked if you would be interested in coming to Australia because he wants to come back to the States. And he'll say you the territory very reasonable. And he is good friends with who who owns Fox? What's that guy's name? Rupert Murdoch. Rupert, yeah, 
he said he's good friends with Rupert Murdoch, so you don't ever have to worry about TV in Australia. And uh, Deborah was uh, pregnant with my daughter Jennifer, and Deborah says, well, if you go, I want to have Jennifer born here, so I'll have to join you. And I, so I called Buddy back, and I said, uh, I'm going to pass on this opportunity. But I really seriously considered it because I loved the pictures I'd seen and the great expanse, and I knew that I could afford to have a really big cattle farm. And, uh, but I didn't. And then the, the last thing I have on Jim Barnett is that when you said, you know, I've done my job here, we, you know, run the Omni, everything's good. Uh, he did not want you to leave and offered you a substantial part of his wealth. And you said in your book, to understand why I didn't even uh, consider Jim's offer, you must understand Jim. Had I accepted part of his wealth, he would assume ownership of me. Yes, yes. Jim, Jim offered. Jim looked on me, I think, as a, a son that he never had. And... He said, Jerry, my plans are to leave uh, whatever I have left to you when I die. I will transfer 25% of that to you right now. And he said, I have a meeting with Tench Cox to go over my financials and my net worth so you'll know what kind of offer this is. And I, I knew the way Jim was because during the course of our relationship, even though I can really say now that I love Jim as a, as a human being and I know how highly he thought of me. He, Jim and I would have some knock down, drag out arguments. And I say that not physically, of course, but we would get into some serious arguments and I'd get in the car and go home. And I would tell him, you know, Jim, I'm not, you know, I'm not your slave. Hmm. And, um, uh, of course, Jim would get his chauffeur and drive to Hendersonville and, oh, my boy, I'm sorry, you know. And so we would patch it, patch it up. But I knew that Jim would assume or mistakenly think that he could take ownership of me and I would be indebted to him uh, for his lifetime. And so I said, no, Jim, I, I really want to go home. And Nick and Roy have offered to give me uh, 10% of the whole promotion. And that's been my lifelong dream. Uh, and so I'm going home. And I said, I'm, I'm, I feel like that I have done everything that I promised you I would do. We've got the first show coming up in the Omni. And that's funny. I think in Bill Watts's recounting, or I'm assuming Bill Watts, maybe it wasn't, of the history to uh, Ron Fuller that, that Bill booked the Omni because in Ron's recount, he doesn't even mention that I was there. Of course, I booked it, and that's been documented uh, throughout history. Then I booked the show in the Omni. But at any rate, I told Jim, uh, I have, uh, you know, I, I'm proud of the work I've done here, but I'm going home. 
So I booked the Omni. Uh, he hired Louis Tillet. Uh, we met in Jim's apartment and I told Louis, um, I booked the show and it's a good one, but you take over the management and you do the finishes because I'm, I won't be here tomorrow. And, um, you know, I had brought my mother down because it was kind of a monumental occasion. Um, I was hoping it would be the history's biggest card. I think it ended up being, uh, second biggest at the time. I think, uh, Eddie had a, uh, a bigger card in Florida somewhere. I mean, a bigger gate. Yeah. But, uh, at any rate, I was real proud of it and I came home and, took ownership of 10% of the territory. And, and oh, good. No, and and everybody knows the story that I ended up with 50% of the territory, I thought. And although I got the profits for years and years and years, it turned out that I really didn't own it. So that's when I left and opened up my own business. How about memories of Ted Turner, one of the most influential men in the history of TV and pro wrestling? In your uh, TNA book, actually, you mentioned that when you were editing shows in Atlanta, he would come sometimes and, and like sit and watch you, right? Oh, yeah. He, uh, he was one of the most personable people that I'd ever met in my life. He was uh, an avid wrestling fan, and I can understand how he took a unknown little UHF station at the time, was about like a college uh, broadcast station, and built it into the super station because Ted had a magnetism about him that just he took over the room when he walked in. So, honestly, when he would come in and pull up a chair uh, and sit behind me, uh, he had various companions, and they were all happened to be beautiful. <laughs> so he would pull up two chairs, and to tell you the truth, it made me very, very nervous. But... Um, you know, Ted would always be very complimentary. I would say, let's cut that out. And Ted would comment, oh, I think that's smart. And so, yes, he would sit there a number of times uh, because he just really loved wrestling. And he loved the process of wrestling. That's interesting. That's very interesting that he would, uh, and it makes sense that, you know, he held on to WCW for all those years when it wasn't making that much money. And I think, you know, there's talk that Turner executives were telling him to sell, but he would never sell until he was out of a position of power because he believed that his business was built on like Andy Griffith and pro wrestling. Right, right. He sure did. And he told me that. Oh. He said, uh, he said, boy, I don't understand why more network executives don't realize that uh, no sport or no entertainment has the loyalty of fans that wrestling does. And I, I don't to this day. I don't understand that. Um, but, you know. They're starting to catch on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another thing that I find interesting because it's something that always kind of bugs me. Uh, you know, there's uh, there was always kind of a talk that this Memphis style was like crazy and it would only work in your territory and uh, wouldn't work in a real wrestling city. And there was even a wrestler who you said in your book that you heard in the restroom saying that that Memphis crazy stuff isn't going to work in Atlanta. And of course it did. Um, 
that just yeah, always that has was... bugged me that people would say that about the Memphis style when really Memphis was just 15, 20 years ahead of everybody, and it worked yeah. great in Atlanta. Yeah, that was uh, a guy named Gary Hart. Uh, I was n- never a real fan of his style. I thought he came across with an arrogance that was bad heat and not good heat. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, he smarted off because he thought nobody was in there. And when he got overheard, he, I'm sure he regretted because, you know, Atlanta popped and everybody in the country would call and want to come in. But, uh, any, you know, I tweeted the other day. Somebody was said, I can't understand why they don't understand such and such. And I tweeted that, you know, you really can't teach stupid <laughs> anything. And I still hear it today, and you do too, that all the Memphis style wouldn't draw money anywhere. Well, it took a dead Atlanta and and started selling out the city auditorium uh, four weeks into a Memphis style program and and took it to the Omni and built it up from there to a company that competed with WWE when WWE had a big head start. We carried the Memphis style to Dallas, and Dallas was bankrupt. And as our conversation with Jeannie, she attested to it, started selling out every week. And then when I left, they went bankrupt again. So, in my opinion, anybody that would say Memphis style would not sell anywhere except Memphis, number one, is uneducated, and it proves they have done no historical research, or they're just stupid. I mean, let's just have some fun here. In, in my opinion, Paul Heyman was secretly a huge Memphis fan and used the Memphis, uh, you know, took that Memphis style for ECW. And then, you know, uh, that found its way into WWE with the Attitude Era. Jim Cornette helped incorporate the Memphis territory when he was booking there in 97. Uh, and they had a really chaotic style and came up with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, so to me, there's a link from Memphis all the way to the biggest boom in the history of the, the industry. Yeah, that's what I say, Sean. And, and let me, let me tell you, as you age in life and as you get older, what you realize is that people are much like birds and some of them just chirp to hear themselves chirp. And, and some of, some of the birds sing beautifully. But because somebody makes noise talking, you just have to learn to disregard it. Well, let me ask you one last question here before I let you go. Um, you got to work with Gordon Soley, right? At this point doing the, the TV? Uh, I worked with Gordon Soley. Gordon was terrific, and and to me, he had a very professional uh, resonance to his voice. I really liked Gordon, too. I thought he was a dedicated, good man. Thank you so much again for your time, as always, Mr. Jarrett, and clearing up these things about the Atlanta wrestling war that we have been hearing for the last 40 years. 
uh, such a hot topic of controversy and rumor, and hopefully we uh, set the record straight on the subject today. We'll be back next week as always. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, subscribe on iTunes, and we have some interesting things coming in the future. Just want to put a teaser out there. Uh, I will be making a trip to Tennessee in the next couple of weeks, and we will be doing some things that I think the Memphis wrestling fans are going to really enjoy. So look forward to that. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody.